Mm. Welcome to the panel room. Uh, we're covering the Harker verse this time, uh, but let's quickly go around the room, let everyone introduce themselves first, and uh, we'll go ahead and start uh, with Natanya. Sure. Hi, I'm Natanya Barron, a writer of dark fantasy and Arthuriana, and occasionally just straight up fiction. Um, I have been writing for about 10 years now, professionally in publishing, but I've been doing it for a lot longer, starting when I was a little kiddo. That's always a, a fun a fun fact. Um, when I rewrote a big chunk of Stephen King's The Stand, so that was kind of how I got my chops by <laughs> involving myself in, in uh, interesting times, considering where we are at the moment. But um, I actually wrote a series of novellas in the Harkerverse in this Shadow Council series, which you can see right here, These Marvelous Beasts, and uh, looking forward to talking about the weird and wonderful all right, great. Uh, Lex. Hi, I'm Alexandra Christian. Um, I usually write contemporary and paranormal romance, but um, I do take time out from that every now and then to write Sherlock Holmes mysteries. And also I write a series, a series of novellas for the Shadow Council archives that star Dr. John Watson. And Sherlock is actually a ghost in my series. Perfect. Uh, Alexander? Hey guys, I am Alexander G.R. Gideon. Um, I write everything from dark fantasy to sci horror to some sci fi, uh, kind of run the gamut there. Um, I write the uh, for the Shadow Council archives as well. Uh, Web of Crimson is the first book in my uh, series, the Books of the Law series, featuring Alex, uh, not Alexander, Alistair Crowley, who is way more of an asshole than I make him out in the books. <laughs> but he is a famous occultist, um, famously bisexual, um, and all around uh, just most amazingly wicked man. All right, perfect. Uh, Gail? Hi, I'm Gail C. Martin uh, and Morgan Bryce. As Gail, I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, steampunk, and more. And as Morgan, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. But for the Harkerverse, my husband Larry and I co-author the Joe Mack series, which is all about Joe Majorek, the legendary Pittsburgh steelworker who uh, trades his soul to the Slavic god of blacksmiths to get justice for his wrongful death in the Homestead riots and becomes champion of uh, those who are without a voice. And so he takes on everything from Leninist uh, werewolves to imperialist vampires. And in the most recent and upcoming uh, one, Al Capone's occult messes that he left behind and helps out Elliot Ness. All right, perfect. And James? I'm James Palmer. I write uh, science fiction and pulp adventure. I've done steampunk. I've written a comic. Um, I wrote a uh, script for the Atlanta Radio Theater Company, and I wrote four novellas in the uh, Park, in the um, Shadow Council Archives series. I'm also the co-creator and editor of the Shared World Alternate History Giant Monster Anthology series, Monster Earth. And finally, John. I'm John Hartness. I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books and servant to a needy and demanding black and white cat named Puck. You'll see more of him as the show goes on, I'm sure. I write the Quincy Harker Demon Hunter series, and I am to blame for everything we're going to be talking about tonight. <laughs> yep, and that's uh, kind of why I ended with you, because uh, I wanted to start the next question off with you. Um, kind of give us an idea of this Harkerverse you've heard mention, uh, Shadow Council. Uh, how'd this all start? It started 
in the very early 90s with Jim Lee. Basically, I'm an old comic book nerd. So the idea of shared universes has been something that I've been a fan of for a long time as a reader. And when I started Falstaff Books and had all these talented writers that I wanted to work with, well, not all of them had things created or things in progress that fit with anything that we publish at Falstaff, but I still wanted to work with them. So within the Quincy Harker Demon Hunter universe, there is an Illuminati-esque organization called the Shadow Council, where paranormal creatures and practitioners police paranormal creatures and practitioners. And canonically, it was created by Count Dracula. And as such, it's been around for several hundreds of years. And the Quincy Harker series takes place in present day. Now, being generally very lazy, I only wanted to coordinate so much with people so I thought, hmm, and I was watching Supernatural and see, kitty, um, I was watching Supernatural and they had this thing where they had the men of letters and they lived in basically their archive library. And I thought, okay, well, you know, a secret society dealing with supernatural crap would have archives. And throughout history, they would deal with stuff. And then I thought, you know, having people go back and write historical figures with paranormal twists would be really interesting. So sometimes I approached people and said, hey, do you want to write something for this? Give me some ideas. Sometimes people approached me and said, hey, I want to write this. And the idea also is to find really talented writers and since Falstaff was, when we started this, a very new press, part of it was me leeching fans and notoriety from more established authors. And then another part of it was a phenomenon that they talked about in professional wrestling for a long time called sprinkling Hulk dust on somebody. When a professional wrestler was up and coming and the promoters wanted to give them a little oomph, they put him in the ring with Hulk Hogan because you sprinkle a little Hulk Hogan dust and all of a sudden they get more visibility than they normally would. Well, Quincy Harker is a pretty, it's our strongest selling series. It moves a lot of books. So I wanted to sprinkle a little Harker dust on some of these authors that are very talented and very skilled, but them writing a historical fantasy novella series for an unknown press might not get a whole lot of recognition. But if I put the Shadow Council on the cover, then it automatically gets the Harker audience interested. So there were a lot of pieces that went, business style pieces that went into it and that's kind of how we ended up with what we've got here. <clears throat> Perfect. Uh, so now I'll move on to uh, you, Natanya. Uh, kind of give a little more detail about your main characters uh, and where they're placed in this universe. Sure. So I think for me, um, everyone sounds like they mostly deal with human beings. Um, I prefer to avoid them whenever possible in, in this particular series. So I took the approach of really going for the, the monsters doing good and daring do and wanted to, uh, if, if you're familiar with anything that I've written, I, I love delving into history. And uh, in particular, I'd always love the idea of sort of a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen style story but with female monster characters. <laughs> and so that was really where the idea came. And I remember typing out on my phone when John emailed me about this, um, gosh, now four years ago, I think, ish. Um, it was right when you were just kind of spitballing this idea. And I love romantic poetry. And I always thought it'd be really cool to have uh, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, who was you know, this, this witch of the woods who would you know, lull people to their graves and the Lamia together who was a snake woman 
um, together living in a very, you know, socially narrow time like the Victorian period or the early Edwardian period and give them, you know, adventures and, and a life and also critique kind of in a Downton Abbey style narrative uh, of what their story would be like kind of protecting dumb soft ass humans um, from themselves usually but kind of living in the background and still having time for tea. And that's really where that started with those two characters and it eventually grew by the time I was done. So the series is three novellas and John will attest to a Natanya novella. It's not exactly a novella. It really only, is. Only one fits the <laughs> science fiction and fantasy writers of America definition of novella. Yeah, and that's the first one. And I think it was like 38,000, but the, 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 last, the last two are, are very close to 50,000 a piece. So you're really getting a honking novel when you get these three novellas together, but that was kind of my idea. And each book is 10 years apart from the other one. So I also purposely put holes in the story so that I could kind of eventually go back to them. I thought that was really cool. And it's multiple point of view, but it's meant to be funny. I mean, it's, it's, it's comic. And I like that about John's writing as well. I didn't want it to just be played for straight. Um, you get a lot of the uh, internal monologue of what it's like, especially with Nerissa, who's the, the Lamia, who, if she could just feed off of human beings and drink their blood all the time, she would. That's constantly what she's fighting against. So, you know, you get this constant sort of narrative uh, while she's doing very normal mundane things that she'd much prefer to rip, rip this guy's head off and just drink out of his, you know, his carotid if, if she could. So um, there's also a character who is um, a, a questing beast. There's very strange vampires who have terrible foot uh, hygiene, which I thought was one of my favorite things. I decided that, that the vampires in this part of of, of the world and my version had, you had to have a special vampire podiatrist to help you out basically. Um, and then there's a lot of crossing with uh, Greek gods and goddesses and kind of the, the whole story really looks at what monsters are and, and how they really are no different than the heroes of so many of the tales. They just got the bad end of the stick. You know, the Medusas and, and, and the Scyllas and the Charybdises, they're all just, you know, somebody told their story and usually they're the ones that are suffering and, and, and the narrative is shifting. So um, it was super fun to do that. It goes from the, the early 1912 period to about 1930 and everything from fashion to language and all of that to be able to play in that. And there's sort of some precursors to the Shadow Council Society. There's a group called the, uh, the, the Circle of Iapetus who are just a bunch of idiots who think that they've stumbled upon all of this stuff, but they end up eventually, in my mind anyway, getting absorbed into the Shadow Council by the 40s. And um, I would eventually like to write a novel about one of the characters who, spoiler, she's actually a unicorn, but um, I wanted to write a book that basically could be marketed as unicorns punching Nazis because um, I oh. thought it'd be great to have her, <laughs> to have her in 1940s kind of Hellboy-esque, you know, story of, of her kind of under, un, undoing the, the, demon, the demons and the, and the Nazis in, in, in that time period. So um, super fun to write. And it's been really cool to be a part of that whole process. Now, so you know, this is how yeah. stories get sold. Yeah. <laughs> you know that you're a genre fiction publisher when you have multiple conversations with editors about the plural, the canonical plural and the correct plural of Lamia. And pronunciation, actually, too. I think we had all kinds of things. But yeah, we ended up having to go back to the Latin to figure out what the plural of that would actually be. And then it's in the it's in the style book per Melissa. And then we decided that there are two. Because in the because the Bubba and Harker universes are connected, but they're both first person. So in the Bubba verse, it's Lamia's, because Bubba don't care. And in the Harker <laughs> yeah, verse, it's I don't even know actually how you say it, Lamia. Lamia, yeah, Lamia. It's, it's it's like alumni, alumna, you know. Yeah. yeah. So in the Harker books, it's the actual correct plural. And in the bubble verse, it's intentionally incorrect because we never use it in narrative in the bubble verse. So, yeah, that's a little in, that's a little too much inside baseball for most people. But you're going to get you're going to get that. Well, we me. have to have style guides. I mean, Melissa in particular was the one to start that, and she she would email. She's like, "You said that Narissa's eyes were yellow, and in this chapter they're red." I'm like, "Yay!" You know. Yeah, we also had to have for the first couple of years that any of these were being created, I edited all of them. Because when I said, pick any folk hero in any country, in any time in history, I didn't expect quite so many of you to pick 
you know, England in the 1890s to 19 teens. But you did. <laughs> so there was, okay, are you using this person? Are you using this? Who's using who and how? And then there's, okay, what can vampires do and not do in the <clears throat> world? But I'm sure we'll get into more of that later. All right. Uh, next one would be Lex. Tell us a little about yours. Well, I... Um... I'm guilty of the 1890s and 19 teens thing. <laughs> um, I write um, about John Watson. John Watson is, of course, the famous sidekick of Sherlock Holmes. And um, poor man, he never gets any play. Like, he never gets to be the star of the show. He's kind of a, you know, um, traditionally, Watson has always been written as an observer, not really, um, not really a man of action. Um, and that always kind of annoyed me. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with like the, uh, the, Bas the Basil Rathbone, um, Sherlock Holmes movies. Watson is always played as like this bumbling idiot who just kind of sits there and, you know, waits for Holmes to figure things out. And then he's like, oh, okay, that's how it was done. Well, and he's not, he couldn't possibly be like that. Yeah, because um, a physician and a war and a war hero. Right, so. exactly. He couldn't possibly be as stupid as he's all as he was presented in those movies, which is what a lot of people grew up with. Um, so he's also he's also always portrayed as being really um, kind of a scaredy cat. I don't know if anybody's seen um, Young Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. um, I love that yes. movie. Yes, it's one of my movie. it's one of my favorite movies ever. Well, I, you know, one of the only, one of the only problems that I have with that movie is that Watson is kind of played as a fraidy cat. Now he's smart, the guy, but he's kind of a, um, and I didn't want I didn't want him to be like that. I wanted him to be kind of a you know um, athletic military guy you know running there man of action doing his thing always carries a gun but he's constantly getting into trouble and really in my in my novella series Watson kind of just you know he starts out at the beginning of the first one and Holmes has just died and he's really depressed about it and he's just kind of you know he's kind of bored um but he wants to just kind of get into a normal life you know, he's left the war behind him. Holmes is gone. So he kind of has this idea of what he's supposed to be. And apparently fate has decided that that is not who he's supposed to be. So he, he keeps finding himself in these unbelievable situations, which at first he's like, this is, there, there's no way that this could possibly be real. Well, then he starts seeing the ghost of Holmes and Holmes, who was always such a skeptic in life. I mean, I guess he, figures that now that he's a ghost he has to believe so holds all in for all of it and he is constantly you know goading Watson into doing more and more and more crazy stuff so you know that's kind of where it came from I'm kind of a Holmes junkie um I had started um I had started out I was writing I was editing Holmes anthologies because I always thought Sherlock Holmes stories were great but they needed to be paranormal and I don't know why I thought I think as a kid I always thought that too and uh, so I decided to do an anthology of Sherlock Holmes stories that were all paranormal. And so um, I edited two different books for Mocha Memoirs Press and um, kind of got obsessed with Sherlock Holmes. And so for a long time, that's all I was writing. And so that was kind of when John sort of approached me about, about doing the Harker books. So I feel like I'm babbling, so I'll shut up now. Thank you for that. Um, Alex, how about your character? So Alistair Crowley is a very interesting man. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about writing him is that it took me about three tries to make him not too much of an asshole. Because the man is a giant asshole. Like, a giant asshole. And, um, but he had a very interesting life. And his life pretty much writes itself. I mean, he was a um, agent for the British secret intelligence. Um, he was, to really give you an idea of how much 
of a repugnant man he was. He actually undermined the German sympathetic movement in New York by going there and supporting it. And <laughs> everyone that was that was part of it just could not stomach being part of this movement that Aleister Crowley was backing. They were just like, and it worked. He completely undermined it. And it, that's just ridiculous that you can be that hated of a person. But I mean, he also, you know, as someone who is myself, um, I am pagan. Um, I kind of mostly identify with Alexandrian Wicca is kind of where I lean towards, which has a lot of um, high magic influence and everything. There's a lot of Crowley influence on, on that. So I've, I've read um, Liber Alvel Legis, the, the book of the law. Um, I've read some of his um, Thelma, Telma, I can never remember if you pronounce the H. Um, some of his stuff, which is honestly completely crazy but is when you look at like what he talks about with mysticism and magic and everything it's still it was groundbreaking and it really set the stage for a lot of what we have now when you look at um like Gardner and um um Buckland who was pretty much the Gardner for uh, the U.S. who just passed away just a couple of years ago, which is kind of sad. Um, but I really dived into Crowley at the beginning of what made him who he was, which was joining the um, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And that was that was really where his story starts. And so I, I kind of wanted to, to have him do that, but also pay homage to the fact that he's a uh, British secret intelligence. So I created the Knight Mages of the Crown, which are basically like a secret order of mages that works for the, the queen and for the country. Um, and the first book, A Web of Crimson, is actually Aleister Crowley investigating the Golden Dawn because they have um, you know members of parliament that are part of that. I mean, even you know, talk about Dr Dracula, Bram Stoker was part of the Golden Dawn at one point as well. And so there was all of these amazing figures, uh, you know, historically and, you know, from uh, government at the time that were part of this. And so it was like, of course, there's something shady going on with that, you know, especially with someone like um, the, one of the characters, Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, who has the longest name you'll ever hear, <laughs> um, being a uh, someone who has that much influence over everyone. I was like, there has to be something going on there. And um, so the first book is out. The second book is in editing hell right now. Um, it should be, <laughs> hopefully it'll be coming out pretty soon. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really fun writing Alistair Crowley. Okay, great. Gail, how about you? Sure. Um, our Shadow Council series uh, is the Joe Mack Adventures. And Joe Mack, as I mentioned before, is the current name taken by Joe Majorac, who was, um, well, for one thing, Joe Majorac as a legendary figure is, the legend is real in the Pittsburgh area and the steel mill areas in, in Pennsylvania as kind of the in the steel workers. And he was the guy who could uh, do more than everybody else, lift more than everybody else, work harder than everybody else. There's some debate whether or not he is a organic <clears throat> legend or whether he was a creative legend, kind of like the John Green Giant. Uh, but he's got a statue in Pittsburgh. There's also some debate on whether or not if someone collected, a folklorist collected this from the mill workers, if they were kind of pulling his leg, because Mazurek, I am told, in Hungarian means dumbass. Um, so there you have it. But Joe Mazurek um, takes part in the Homestead Riots. He's just a Hungarian immigrant who wanted to come over here for a better life for himself and his wife and his son. Within a year, his wife and son are dead. He's working at the mill. They're being mistreated as they were. He believes nothing good is going to come of this, but even so, he stands in solidarity with the other mill workers. And if you know anything about how the homestead riots actually came out, the mill owners hired the Pinkertons, the Pinkertons mowed everybody down and they jailed the organizers and then they hired scabs and it, it was pretty much a massacre. So as he's dying there among the bodies of his friends, he 
Uh, he thinks about how he gave up on praying to the Christian God when he buried his, his wife and child, but he always respected that his grandmother prayed to the old gods and kept their icons behind the pretty Christian pictures of St. Peter and St. Paul. And so as he's dying, he calls on Krukus, the Slavic god of blacksmiths for justice. And Krukus shows up and makes him his champion, makes him immortal, gives him the ability to call on Krukus's magic to uh, make his skin metallic for a short period of time, makes his bones steel, he can't die by anything except being melted in a crucible in a, a steel mill, something of that heat, and <clears throat> makes him his champion. So fast forward to 1928, which is where the first book takes place, and he uses that ability to deal with supernatural creatures who are preying on humans. And he's got a colorful cast of characters around him, Ben Levecchia, who is the youngest son of Vincent Lavecchia, who runs the Cleveland, runs one of the Cleveland mafia families. Benny has tried to get out of the business as far as someone in his position can. He runs a speakeasy underneath the theater. And uh, his, his father keeps showing up and kind of protecting him against his will. But Ben's a good guy. He's also a strega, which is a, an Italian witch. Uh, one of Joe's other friends is Jack West, who is a Service agent who enlists help. I really took that character's inspiration very much from Jim West in the Wild Wild West, that kind of good looking, snarky, smart mouth, uh, yeah, I know everything kind of, of character. And, uh, but he's a good guy when the chips are down. And then Sarah Grace McAllen Herringworth, who is an heiress, uh, both on the coal and steel side. But she also spilled the beans out of conscience on the role of the Pittsburgh families in the South Fork Dam collapse, which led to the Johnstown flood. So she really kind of likes working across purposes to the um, 90, you know, to the 1% of her time, the Gilded Era. She also pick locks, uh, but her name open her name opens every door and the ones that it can't, she can pick the locks for. So she's always up for an adventure and she has a private pulling car and she just kind of greases the skids. So in the first one, they're going up against uh, Leninist werewolves and imperialist vampires and um, Rasputin makes an appearance uh, because he really needed to, why not? It was fun. Among the Russian immigrants in Cleveland. In the second book, Black Sun, we actually touch on, it takes place in Reading, Pennsylvania, which is a hotbed of um, pro-German sentiment in 1928. We actually use the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. They're not necessarily the good guys in this one, and I always have to chuckle every time I wrote that because there was a grocery store chain where I grew up called the Golden Dawn. And so I always pictured these guys in regalia standing in front of a food lion. Uh, so yeah, it was funnier in my head, but um, <laughs> they're basically trying to stop a plot and, and you get into eldritch monsters and the Vril and the Free Society of Teutonia and, and all kinds of things and found out that three of the most important uh, Pennsylvania German grimoires were authored and printed in Reading uh, at or before that time, so who knew? And then uh, the current one that's currently in edits with uh, Falstaff is Chicagoland. And this is where Elliot Ness gives Jack West a call and says, hey, I need your help. We've, um, we've arrested Al Capone and he's left a mess with, we think we've got a loose werewolf and we might have a loose vampire and we're really not sure what's going on with some vengeful ghosts. Can you help me clean it up? And Jack calls in uh, Joe Majora, you know, Joe Mack. And of course, Sarah says, I'm in, let's take my private car. And um, there we go, off to the races. All right, perfect. Um, James, how about you, your your character and where they fit in? Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm another one of the Victorian authors. Uh, my, uh, um, my four novellas begins with a novella called The Depths of Time, uh, in which uh, Captain Sir Richard Francis Burton uh, joins Captain Nemo, Professor Challenger, and the Time Traveler from H.G. Wells' The Time Machine aboard the Nautilus to travel back in time to fight Cthulhu. Um, that's in a loose nutshell, that, that's, that's what it is. That's what I tell people, and 
uh, usually results in them buying a copy. So I keep saying it. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, it deals with uh, a lot of Love, Lovecraftian threats. Uh, and in the, in, in the last one, they're uh, called the Map of Time. They're fighting Morlocks, and there's lots of time travel. And um, had a lot of fun with those, um, those old, you know, the public domain um, Victorian literary characters, uh, mixing it up with real historical figures. Um, I had, um, you know, John mentioned this, or having, having, you know, couldn't have characters that other people were using. I ran into that a couple of times. Uh, once with Sherlock Holmes, I was going to have, uh, him meet Holmes and I found out I couldn't use him. So I changed it. I changed Sherlock to his brother, Mycroft Holmes. And I added in a policeman named uh, Frederick Aberline, who was in charge of the Jack the Ripper uh, murder investigation um, after the events and this stuff takes place. Um, so, yeah, it was just a lot of fun. It was, and it was a weird just kind of idea that I had. Uh, I posted on Facebook to see if anybody wanted to publish it. And John said, yeah, send me a send me something about it. And he said, yeah, make this part of the Shadow Council archives and I need four of them. Uh, and I said, uh, okay, I only had the one idea, but I said, sure, why not? Um, and fortunately it worked out. All right, perfect. Um, so next uh, I'll go with you, Lex. Uh, your character, you know, like you said, uh, Watson, has always been the secondary character. You kind of touched on it a little bit, but when writing this character, what were you changing, keeping, you know, in making it your own? And how did you make it your own? Well, hmm. Again, I, I decided to make Watson just really a kind of a snarky bully <laughs> I mean he's no he's not really a bully but um the very first thing that happens in the first book is that he is drowning his troubles in a bar where they happen to be having prize fighting and his big mouth and his liquid courage end up getting him involved in um a prize fight with a very, very big man. And I, I apparently I like this theme because it keeps happening. Um, I just wrote a scene for the third one today that is um, Watson getting his ass kicked by somebody that's a lot bigger than him. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if I really changed it because people have done Watson in so many different ways, but um, I wanna give, I, I like giving him a chance to be kind of John Watson action hero. Um, he does a lot of um, fist fighting. He does a lot of uh, shooting with a gun. He does a lot of, um, in the first book, he got introduced to this weapon that's very, it's a very steampunky um, automatic weapon that involves silver stakes that have spells on them, um, which, I mean, you know, that's pretty fantastical, I thought. Um, he just, you know, I wanted him to be an observer. I wanted him to be the impetus of the story. And so kind of making him into a main character, um, that's probably the most that I've done. It's, I didn't want him to be telling the story of somebody else's deeds. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, that's probably the biggest thing is making him uh, making him the hero of his own story. And that's kind of what Watson's arc through the novellas is, are, is. Um, Watson is realizing that he can be the hero of his own story. And that's his own, you know, character growth. He kind of realizes he's been, you know, he's been supporting Holmes instead of doing it for himself. Which it has to itself in a really big way in the last of the last novella so stay tuned <laughs> perfect thank you um alex having alistair be an actual historical figure how did that impact the things you had to do 
it impacted it a lot. Like I said, Aleister Crowley was a repugnant human being. He was um, misogynistic, hedonistic, drug addled. Like he was every, pretty much if you could think of like something that makes someone undesirable, he was probably it. And so I know me and John went back and forth like two times on two different versions where John kept telling me, he's too much of an asshole. I don't like him. You got to tone it down. It, it wasn't, he's too much of an asshole. I don't like him. It's, he's too much of an asshole. No one will buy this. <laughs> because Fair. that's kind of the core that you're working <laughs> with when you make a villain, because Crowley's not a good person. When you make a bad person your protagonist, you can't show off exactly how bad they are because this is a series. There's going to be multiple novellas. If they hate Crowley in book one, they're not going to buy book two. <laughs> so Al Alex did a lot of good work in toning down the assholishness of Crowley. And screw it, it's magic. <laughs> And that's kind of a lot of what I've, I'm planning on doing with the books um, through these first four and beyond if we get there, um, is really kind of showing a progression of Crowley from who he is in book one, who is kind of, he's, I mean, he's, he's got some like dickish moments, but he's, he's mostly kind of a good guy in the first book and kind of showing this progression of how he becomes known as the wickedest man in the world. And that that's what he was known as, um, you know, during his time. And so there's through the uh, progress of everything that's happening and kind of through relationships that he's having with um, two of the, the side characters, um, or the secondary characters, um, Elaine Simpson, who is really important um, you know, to the narrative and with uh, Julian Baker and kind of showing this relationship and, and its progression and it kind of informs what becomes of him. Um, but I mean, all of the characters that I use, well, mostly all of the characters that I use are historical figures. I mean, I use Samuel Little McGregor Mathers who is the man who started the Golden Dawn. Um, he shows up in this book and in the second book. Um, I use Elaine Simpson, who he had a relationship with while he was part of the, um, the Golden Dawn and um, the whole incident with the Vault of the Adepts, which is kind of the impetus for the second book um, they did together. And then Julian Baker, who um, is actually the person uh, historically who got Crowley to come into the Golden Dawn. And so, you know, I'm having to, to use all of them. And then, you know, you've got Julian Baker who in the books are, is kind of, um, it's kind of unknown who and what he is because he can do things that no one else can. And it frustrates the hell out of Crowley that he can't figure out how he can do these things. Um, and then you've got Elaine Simpson who, you know, came from a really good family in, you know, historically, but in the books definitely has a lot of mystery around who she is, where she came from, why she's doing what she's doing. And that's a lot of what I explore in the second and third books of uh, the series as well. Okay, great. Uh, Gail, um, anything surprise you when you're researching Joe Mack? Yeah, um, the second book in particular, Black Sun, is set in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I always try to pick locations for any of our books that, uh, I'm familiar with in real life, whether I've lived there, visited there, vacationed there, driven through it more than once, uh, because each place has a vibe and there are, there's just an energy to different places and it helps if you've been there. And my dad's family is from the Reading area. There are nine generations of dead Zaners buried in a cemetery uh, upcountry from Reading been there for a very long time. And so I thought I knew the area. I was familiar with some places like the Reading Pagoda, which, hey, here's this uh, textile town in the middle of, in, in Eastern Pennsylvania that has a not really mountain with a Japanese pagoda on top that, by the way, lights up with neon all around the edges. How weird is that? 
Uh, it was going to be a hotel, never quite got there. John's making jazz hands, but his, his voice has turned off. Um, so it yeah, really I wasn't saying anything, <laughs> but, you know, I would be more surprised about the level of psychotic in Pennsylvania locales if I hadn't edited as many of the Mark Wojcik novellas as I have. Because having done that, Pennsylvania's weird, y'all. This is true. We've been saying that for years. Um, I knew there were coal mines under the area. Um, I did not know about the grimoires that had been written and published in the Reading area in the 1700s that formed the foundation for what gets called um, powwow magic in Pennsylvania Dutch. And of course, Pennsylvania Dutch is low German, Pennsylvania Deutsch. Um, and so when I, when I drew on that and I drew on the uh, folk healers and the folk witches of uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch community, I put in all kinds of little Easter eggs like, you know, one of the guys lives in the house that my grandparents bought in 1918 um, and got to play with some of those things. But I didn't know there were tunnels underneath Reading that uh, served the Prohibition era uh, speakeasies. And I didn't know about, um, you know, some of the um, massacres. There was a, a labor massacre uh, on the railroad line there. So it was really interesting taking a city that I thought I knew, and finding out all of this stuff. And the book would technically, by taking place in 1928, technically would have happened when my dad was about five years old. So there is a kid who runs through at one point and give some information to Joe Mack and headcanon, although the child is never named, that's actually, you know, in my head, that's my dad. Um, got to run through, give him some information, run on. He was actually chasing the cart horse to clean up the poop that the cart horse would do in the street because his mom would give him five cents a bucket to put it on the, the garden, true story. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really interesting exploring that city on a whole different level and looking at all of the uh, archival pictures. There were really expensive hotels on the not quite mountains in, you know, to one side of the city that either burned or had suspicious fires or just went out of business uh, during the depression. Uh, and sometimes a little bit before that, it was one of those, we'll, we'll start a tourist boom that didn't work. <coughs> Pardon me, didn't know anything about any of those until we wrote the book. So that was that was really interesting. And then this new one, got to go to Chicago, find out a lot of stuff about Al Capone that I didn't know, and got to visit some real life locations like what was left of the H.H. H. Holmes murder house, murder castle. Um, first two stories by this time were burned, but still the bottom story still existed. Um, all the tunnels under Chicago uh, and the sub subterranean levels and, uh, so it's always fun to bring in all these real historical aspects and then twist them a little bit and take some authorial license with them, whether they're people or locations or oddities about the, the place and use them to serve the story. That's one of the most fun parts. And you can really go down that rabbit hole very far. All right, thank you. Uh, James, having yours as an explorer, uh, like you said, you were blending literary with uh, real life characters. Uh, how did that go for you? And, you know, the same question I ask uh, everyone else, uh, what part of him did you keep? You know, obviously he didn't ride around with Nemo, but. Um, well, you know, I, I tried to make it, I, it, it becomes an alternate history at some point because of the time travel aspect. But um, in the beginning, it, it, it's kind of a, a secret history. Um, I, I like that he was this kind of man of action. I mean, he he um, he was one of the first white men to go to Mecca. He he went in disguise. I mean, he would have been killed if they had found him out. Um, he uh, it explored and and you know found the the source of the Nile. He uh, uh, he he took a spear to the face, which is pretty badass. Um, and, and, and lived to tell about it. He, you know, he, he caught, uh, 
caught malaria a couple of times, lived through that. He was a, he was a swordsman. He was a, um, a, a, a poet. He, he translated the uh, Arabian Nights um, and, and a couple other books. He was, he was an eth ethnographer. Um, he was a spy. He was a soldier. And he, he just, he did it all. And I, I tried to, you know, incorporate, uh, you know, he made good use of those skills uh, in, in, in my stories. And uh, it, it helped, it helps him deal with all the Lovecraftian weirdness. Um, Cause in, in those stories that tends to make everybody insane, you know, right. but he's, he's able to uh, look at it just like he would in another culture um, of, of human beings and kind of deal with it that way. Um, so it, 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 it was a lot of fun. It, it, I think it, I think it meshed well together. I tried to find, um, you know, people who were contemporary, of course, um, cause that always interests me too with history is who could have known, you know, this person over here had they actually met and, and used people that he actually knew, um, or could have known conceivably, um, like uh, his his friend uh, Algernon Swinburne, the the young poet, um, and then you know he gets to um, he he does get to meet Crowley uh, after a fashion. I had to promise John and and Alexander that I wouldn't that that timeline would collapse, that it would cease to exist. So it, it's kind of an alternate, a World War Two era. Um, written i had written this uh i had written a a uh, harry houdini story years ago for another anthology in which houdini and um uh Sir Arthur conan doyle have to stop crowley from getting the spear of destiny and i did some research on crowley and i found out that he actually went to the government to to start up kind of an occult ministry to combat hitler on a on a magical front and they turned him down, but I always thought, wouldn't it be cool if they'd said yes? And I sat on that for years, and I finally had a chance in this to use it. So Burton goes into this alternate timeline where he's done that, and his liaison with the Navy was actually a young man you might have heard of named Ian Fleming. So Ian Fleming's in there too. Um, but then everything goes back like it's supposed to be, and, and that whole that whole thing collapses. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, I yeah I, I wanted to be I admire him so much that I wanted to keep as much of his essence and I I hope I did that I I think so it's um I you know I I, I kind of felt bad for resurrecting him and making him chase monsters. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, so John, uh, picking the child of uh, John and Mina Harker. Why? <laughs> and was there anything, uh, it's been a while since I've attempted to read Dracula. Is there anything in the, the books or was this just your creation? No, it's definitely not my creation. Um, Quincy Harker is canonically the child of Jonathan Harker and Mina Murray. Um, and he is named after the four men who are part of the party that goes after Dracula. Um, oh God, I'm going to screw up the order again, but I think that it's Jonathan Quincy Abraham Homewood Harker. So he has four first names. Um, and, but I, and I did not come up with that. And Quincy Harker also appears in some Marvel comics um, from the 80s, I believe, but he appears in the Marvel comics as a 90 plus year old wheelchair bound man who I think dies in the same issue he debuts in. So I'm not the first person to use this character. I don't remember why I picked the, I think I just needed, I needed someone magical. I, I, I've told many times the evolution of Quincy Harker was I saw the ads for the TV show Hellblazer 
and I knew, or the TV show Constantine, and I knew it wasn't going to be very good because you can't drop F-bombs on NBC. <laughs> and I was right. While Matt Ryan is a brilliant John Constantine, that show was only a C minus on its best day. Well, I decided that if, and they very much Americanized the John Constantine character. And I was like, nah, if y'all gonna write an American John Constantine, I'll show you how to do it. And it's gonna require a lot more profanity. So then I needed someone inherently magical and I wanted to play with Dracula. So, okay, well, who's gonna start the day magical and would know Dracula? Well, all right, if Dracula didn't die, because he doesn't have to, fine. It's Stoker's dead. He's not going to bitch about it. Um, so if Dracula, okay, so Dracula chewed on Mina Murray and Dracula's wives chewed on Jonathan Harker. So if vampires gnaw on both your parents, but they don't turn you, it's probably going to jack up your DNA a little bit. And Quincy being the oldest son, um, he got all the magic and none of it went down the family tree. In Stoker's world, I believe Har Quincy Harker has a sister. In my world, he had two brothers, both deceased. Um, and both died very young in my, in my world. But yeah, um, I wanted to play with Dracula and I wanted to play with magic. So I picked somebody who should naturally be able to play with magic and would know Dracula. Perfect. Uh, so it's done okay. Yeah. Natalia now. Uh, no, sorry, Natanya. Um, how about yours with uh, the mythology? Yeah, so I'd say primarily what I did is I really, and this is something that I've been interested in since the, my, my first novel is all that one, Pilgrim of the Sky, is all about sort of synthesizing a lot of mythologies because there are so many uh, core stories that really repeat again and again, you know, across time and culture and religion. And that concept has always been really interesting to me. And so a lot of what I did, especially in the second and third books, which take place in Cairo and London and Spain, respectively, was really to look at, you know, different cultures and how, how different cultures saw, uh, their religion slash mythology and where that overlap was. Um, I came from a conservative Christian background, but when I went to college, I spent a lot of time kind of dissecting that. And even when I was, you know, more active in church, I, I remember actually reading the Bible and going, these angels don't look like the angels on the manger. These are really freaky and kind of awesome, but why does no one talk about this? So really kind of dissecting, you know, the aesthetics, the, the beauty, but also the stories that are behind that, I think really influenced the work that I did. I think, um, like I said a little bit earlier, a lot of the, the, the visual part of it is really important because I think monsters, um, it's so much about what they look like and what is considered a standard of beauty. And, and obviously queerness is a really big part of the story. Um, there's, I think, not even a single, <laughs> single straight character 100% in the whole series, if you really look at it. Um, I wasn't on purpose, but I also, there's definitely an extended metaphor for queerness and, and, and creating found families as well is, is a big part of, of the tale. I'd say in terms of, of mining actual literature, you know, Keats poetry and uh, Coleridge's poetry, I spent a lot of time, I wanted Narissa to actually look like the Lamia in Keats's Lamia. And it's actually a very beautiful description. It's in the front of the book because you can kind of tell even he's sort of awed by this new kind of beauty. I mean, she's not, he doesn't use words of disgust. They're bright colors and striped like different animals. And, you know, you get this really beautiful visual. And Narissa spends most of the books trying to cover that up because she can, she has a glamour ability. She can look like a pretty boring librarian looking woman with a big nose. And, you know, that's just kind of people glance her over because she looks like she's a spinster and they kind of ignore her. But when she shows who she really is, she's become so used to scaring people. But eventually she finds someone who finds her absolutely beautiful. And, and that is, I think, the best that, that a lot of us can ask for. And and certainly something that the, the Victorians, the Edwardians thought a lot about as well. You know, there's a lot of sumptuous beauty, but there's a lot of 
you know, the, the dark underside, the sort of other stories of, of people who are, you know, living the contrasted side of things. And, and for me that, the, you know, I, I think Sherry Priest said this way back in the day when I was first getting into steampunk and sort of writing in Victorian worlds. And she, she said, you know, history is always going to be stranger than anything you can make up. You can, you, you're going to find things that you just, you could never have come up with. And those are so much fun. Um, I think my favorite is uh, Serket, who's the, the Egyptian goddess. Her head is a scorpion. She's got a huge cat sized scorpion on top of her head. And I just thought that would be amazing to write a character who, who is this horrific, but also kind of beautiful and also hilarious. She's kind of like an old, you know, crone who's just had enough of everybody's shit. And she's tired of everyone coming down to the underworld and asking things from her. And she ends up actually being nice because people are asking for her opinion. And she's like, you, you, you just want my thoughts? <laughs> it's like this sort of moment of, you know, usually people are asking the gods for something, give me something, give me something. They're like, no, I just want your thoughts on the matter. Um, and, and, and the occurrence of frogs and things in Egyptian and, and in, in Hebrew mythology was really fascinating. Another thing that I brought in, I created these really creepy frog creatures who kind of, I, I wanted like an extended version of that uh, senator in the X-Men movie who kind of turns into that weird watery creature squeezes through things like the sort of gross tactile nastiness and and I like I like grossing people out when I when I can um and then and then finally it was really the Greek mythology stuff and there's it's so deep and I read Circe in the middle of writing the last two books and it was really interesting because that again is another story that basically like what is a dryad what is a sylph what are you know all these all these offspring of all these gods from awful rapes and, 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 you know, disguised, you know, totally non-consensual anything. And, oh, she looked at Aphrodite badly one day. Well, let's just turn her into a monster. So you really have this really beautiful, deep well of stories to pull from. Um, and particularly for me, the metamorphoses um, has always been one of my favorite books, uh, Ovid's poetry. And I pulled a lot from that as well, because there's just so many interesting stories about creatures being made and um but also the a little bit of humor in that too because you can't get through you can't get through all that nastiness without having a little bit of a sense of humor perfect thanks so much um final question and i asked this when we did the bubbaverse panel uh, i want to get everyone's take on what it's like to write in this shared universe and i'll start with you gail a lot of fun. I mean, I, I, I'm really thrilled to be part of the gang, both here in the Harperverse and also with our Spell, Salt and Steel series in the Bubbleverse. Um, it's just a lot of fun playing in somebody else's sandbox and getting to explore a little corner of that world and coordinating things. And um, so I have had other shared world experiences fraught and this is not um you know john's great to work with and we work out some of the points of contact ahead of time and um i did assure him with the bubba verse that pennsylvania is a lot like south carolina only with more flannel and i think over uh what seven books now we've i think i may have persuaded you of that um but it's yeah. just it's a lot of fun and it's it's kind of fun having a gang of people who um are all playing in the same world. I love it. Okay. James. Um, yeah, it's it, it it it's fun. It all of our stuff is so different. Um, but as long as we don't step on each other's uh characters and time periods and things and overlap too much, it just for some reason it just works. Um and you know John and everybody at Falstaff has has been really great to work with. He's got uh um, some you know, dynamite editors who, who kept reminding me how to spell Faton, um, as in yeah, yeah, Cthulhu Faton, and uh, great cover artists, and, and just everybody's super cool. And you know, we hang out at cons and stuff when we can, and uh, it's just it's, it's like being part of a little literary community. All right, uh, John, what do you think of everyone? joining you in your universe? Well, it's interesting. This, this universe is 
very different from the Bubba verse in that it requires less oversight because they're in the Bubba verse, it's all contemporary and it's all within one country. So there are more poli political entities and organizations that have to tie together more cleanly. Yes, the cat's pulling focus again. <clears throat> I know, he's right over there. Um, with this, it was basically I want to write these characters in this time period. Is anybody else playing in this time period? In a lot of cases, that was no. Um, I believe that Gale's Shadow Council books are the only ones that take place in the United States. Most of the rest of them, well, the Frost, Frost and Filigree, the first of Natanya's is in the U.S., but it's not but the rest of the series is in Europe and Africa. And the, a lot of the others are throughout Europe. So I didn't have to sweat as much someone driving 200 miles in a day and bumping into another person. Because these are designed as, these are the case files that someone reading the archives of the Shadow Council would find, they don't have to tie together all that closely. So it's easier to manage in that regard. Um, it's more difficult in that there is more existing folklore in almost all of these. And then as people bring in real characters, we decide what's real in this world versus what's real in the real world, um, which pieces do we want to use? So we're pulling from canon, we're pulling from the universe canon, we're pulling from real history. So that's a fun juggling experience. It's also been a lot of fun to work with authors at all different points on the graph um, career-wise. Web of Crimson is one of Alex's first publications. So we got a chance first to- First standalone. Right, we got a chance to publish his first work. Gail has been publishing longer than I have. So it's, um, these are, this is further along in her career and it's been fun to, work with people on the on those different spots along the continuum. So I like it. Um, we will probably proceed with a lot more novels moving forward, just because novels sell better than novellas and our company's infrastructure is better designed to create novels now than it was when we started. Our editorial is stronger and our editors can handle more and longer works. So as the company's grown, the books have grown. So Natanya fits in a lot better now than she did when we started because now we're publishing big, long, wordy books. All right, so Natanya, what about your- That's actually a pretty good segue um, okay. because what I was gonna say was more than anything, and maybe this is a little self-serving, but when this came to me, it was in a really rough time for me as a writer. I'd had some pretty good early success. I worked with the big six publisher, came out feeling really wretched for a while and really losing a couple of years to not just the difficulties of trying to figure out how to do this, but my husband lost his job a couple of times. I was the primary breadwinner. My son is autistic. So dealing with his diagnosis and having a baby, I decided to have a baby right as I first released my book, not, not my first novel here. So don't recommend that if you have the choice. And I, it was at a time where I was feeling like maybe this just isn't the thing for me and kind of dipping my toe back into going to cons again and meeting people is how I kind of, you know, tangentially got to meet John in, in person and to have someone be like, Hey, just try something, just work it out. You know, just write what you want. It, it, you know, gave me a whole lot of confidence and helped me really build my, my fan base, figure out what it is that I wanted to be as a person. And 
um, you know, that kind of work and working with the quality of editors. And, and it's not just the develop, developmental and, and copy editing. It's also just, you know, being part of something bigger. You kind of have the wind at your back a little bit is, is incredibly helpful. And since I started writing for, for John, I've, I joke, you know, like we, the more you ignore your career, the better it goes. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, how these things work, but I actually, um, my, my new book that just came out, the, um, I just got a, a, a library journal review this morning and I went to their page and it was, a, it was nine years to the day of my library review journal, library journal review of this book. So it was like this weird parallel of like December 1st, 2011 and December 1st, 2020 happened to be the reviews of those books. And you're just like, wow, so much has happened. But the last five years, I couldn't be where I, I, I can be now if it wasn't for someone like John really taking um, you know, a chance and saying, hey, I, I believe in you and you can do this and, and this is good stuff. Because it's, as you all know, I'm sure the, the industry is just so full of rejection and you hit a point and you think that this is where it's supposed to be. And it's, it's depressing, it's awful. It's, <laughs> not what you wanted and you lose that joy of writing what makes your heart sing and you know the last couple of years especially the last four years in a lot of ways have been so hard for writers to get through a lot of that and you know it is our communities and it is writing as part of a series and you feel like you you have more you have more at stake if you're writing in a shared universe you know I, I told somebody that I know and, and and trust like a brother that I'm going to write this I'm going to write this I'm going to do it instead of you just kind of sitting in, in a corner. Um, and that, that to me is just invaluable. And I, I, I am incredibly grateful for the whole experience. Thank you. Uh, Alex, I mean, Alexandra, sorry. Hey, whatever, you know. <laughs> um, well, okay, shared universe was kind of, it was kind of familiar for me and kind of not familiar for me. Um, my college days were full of fan fiction I kind of have to admit that. Um, so um, in that sense, writing in a shared universe, you know, everybody's writing in a shared universe, but you're kind of like in a bubble because, you know, that's not, you're not really collaborating with those people, you know? Um, it's like everybody is writing in this separate amorphous, Thing. and you have people that like the way you did it and people that hate the way you did it and so and that's that and then as a romance novelist shared universe isn't really that's not really something we do um sometimes every now and then there there are a few things um that people do but romance is all about the self-contained story that gets to the happily ever after at the end you know um it's not really an ongoing thing um, so shared universe was not exactly in this way was not really familiar for me. And I find myself constantly being worried that I'm going to like mess somebody's timeline up with something that I do. So I always try to make a conscious effort to make my stories so self-contained, I guess. Um, even though I did find myself, um, with, mentioning Crowley in one of my books and I, I swear I didn't even know that I didn't even know that Alexander was using Crowley when I did that and then I mentioned this and they're like oh yeah Alexander he's doing he's doing everyone Crowley wants to play in my books. sandbox I know and I was like oh crap your dirty gross because sandbox I was intentionally, <laughs> yeah well I was intentionally trying to you know find a, a historical figure that would go with the with the story that I was telling that wouldn't mess with anybody else's stuff you know because I know I, sometimes I don't like people playing with my stuff. So I didn't want to mess anybody else up. But, um, you know, and I also, some other folks that I know have had experiences writing in the Harker universe where, you know, they would start writing something and then they would get to a point where they were kind of like taking somebody out of somebody. I didn't want to worry about all that. So I kind of created my own conduit between um, between Watson and the Shadow Council so that I wouldn't actually have to, so I wouldn't have to pull, you know, any characters out that might be doing something else. And um, so I ended up borrowing my own character from another book that I had written to be sort of a conduit between them. Um, plus it also helped tie that book in because that book was with Falstaff. So it kind of helped tie that book into other books that I had written for Falstaff. But um yeah, I mean, so I find I find it difficult, but also at the same time, really, really fun. Um, 
I think when you're going to write in a shared universe, you have to be writing with people that you like. Um, otherwise, it's never going to work because you're going to be constantly fighting for position. But we don't ever we don't have that problem. So, you know, it's a lot of fun. All right, perfect. Lex and um, S.H. Roddy had probably the toughest tasks in that they were the ones who had established Harker versus Cannon that they had to deal with because Jack Watson, a descendant of John Watson, is a current member of the Shadow Council. And um, Susan's books feature Frankenstein's monster and feature Dracula as a secondary character. So, and both of those are characters that exist in the current Quincy Harker novels. So those two and I had to coordinate much more closely with making sure that nothing, none of the stones they're throwing in the pond in Victorian England make ripples that contradict books I've already published. It's right. easy. And, that and that's not, that is not an easy, <laughs> That's not always the easiest thing to do. <laughs> it's a lot easier when it's something like having Harker make a throwaway line referencing Alamia who lived in the Northeastern United States back at the turn of the 20th century. But as far as he knew, she was the last of her kind because Frost and Filigree had already been written before I wrote the book that took place in present day. But yeah, having four, I think we were four Harker books in before Lex and Susan started writing their Shadow Council books. So they had a lot more of that kind of canonical coordination that they had to do. And more homework because I sent them all of the Harker books to read before they started on these things and said, well, you know, this, this is going to save you time if you read all of these because then you'll know what yeah. vampires can't do <laughs> well and the and you know the good news is is that in order to have jack we have to eventually have mary morston come into it so <laughs> yes. congratulations she's going to be in the second book <laughs> yeah because when when i was creating jack i did my massive amounts of research on holmes legend in other words, I went to Wikipedia for about five minutes and I was like, okay, right. when does he need to be born? That's all I really need is if he's this old, if he's this old now, what, how many greats is that and who is born when and who dies when? Okay, fine. That's all I need. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Uh, finally, Alex. So it was kind of interesting how I fell into to writing these. I think it was 2016, I think it was. And we were at a, um, there was a annual writing retreat that um, me and a group of um, authors would put on that we would go to. And we had, um, we'd bring in established writers. Um, we brought in Faith Hunter, uh, David Coe, and John kind of as like, to, to talk with us about, you know, where we're at, and what's going on. And at that, it was probably our, I think it was our third writing retreat. John comes in and he's talking about the Shadow Council archives and, and, you know, opening this, this world up and having the shared universe. And he, he just makes this comment. He goes, I'm just surprised that no one's wanted to write Aleister Crowley. And I went, me, <laughs> I am all over Aleister Crowley. And he said, all right, give me, uh, synopses for the first four books and I had it to him two weeks later that was it was at up to that point we had we had had an anthology that we were planning with the retreat as a benefit anthology for um, one of our members who had you know very suddenly passed away and we wanted to do a um, benefit anthology um, for uh, her significant other that she was leaving behind and so I had I had that um publication that was coming on but they didn't really feel like the real publication because it was something that we were self-producing and everything and so honestly this book even though it took like four years to get it out um was like the first 
like foot in the door that I had. Of course, I've had a couple of other um, anthology sales, but writing this one was so much different because up to that point, I'd only ever really finished short stories. And I was, had, I've, at this point, I think I'm fairly decent at writing short stories and, and getting and writing to that length, but I'd never written something this long or at least finished it. I had about 20,000 words in a, um, a novel that I had started that is going to end up getting scrapped because four years of working on this book, there's a reason it took four years. And it's because writing at this length, it was really green. And being able to come into an established universe and work with this character and, and have these rules that I can play around with kind of gives me that basis. And then I worked with three editors on this book <laughs> total um i think and it i, it, I was the meanest <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah, did you ever read uh, teresa's comments yes. i saw them before you did <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, fine he's already lived through mine go for it <laughs> I, know, I think the only two things that I, I, I fought one battle and won and fought one battle and lost. And that was the um, established spelling of magic. And it's really hard for Crowley because he is the person, he is the reason why people spell it M-A-G-I-C-K because he, he was the one that made the distinction between the two. So I had to make a compromise and have a book title with the, the K in there. That was a lot of changing I had to do. And then the battle that I won was... Um, I had some dialogue in a point that was really wordy, really like over the top. And it was like, we need to clean this up. And I was like, this is actual golden dawn ritual. So let's leave it as it is. And that was the one battle that I won. Um, I like fine. If it's actual history, it can still suck. <laughs> oh yeah. It makes no sense at all, but it's, it's, it's actual ritual. So companies named after a shakespearean character i we get that sometimes <laughs> older doesn't necessarily mean high uh, quality. <laughs> yeah. um but it's been really fun you know working with these characters and being able to to bring in you know some aspects with the first book the shadow council is only really mentioned and it's shadow council is something that's you know slowly through the books i plan to bring in because Crowley is too much of an egoist. He's there's no way that he's not going to worm his way into an organization like the Shadow Council. Like he's he's going to be all up in that. But it's showing the progression of how that happens that I'm really wanting I'm, I'm wanting to do with the books. Perfect. The great part about having all these folks writing these historical fiction accounts of the shadow council archives means that if i blow up the shadow council over the next year then it doesn't affect anything that they're that they've already done or are doing so you know i could kill them all i'm not going to kill them all but <laughs> <clears throat> also it's been tried and some of them we're not sure can even die but another panel altogether, isn't it yeah <laughs> for real all right Perfect. So uh, let's go ahead and go around the room again. Have everyone let the audience know where they can find you on the internet. And we'll start with you, John. You can find me at falstaffbooks.com. We have a, you can order paperbacks and eBooks from the Falstaff site. You can also find me, probably the best place for fan interaction is my Facebook group called John G. Hartness Books. It's uh, just go on Facebook and search for John G. Hartness books and that will get you there. Answer the membership questions because that's how I know you're not a bot. Um, <clears throat> don't answer the questions, don't get in the group. And I'm on all of those other random social media things but Twitter's a wretched hive of scum and villainy so I basically only use it for auto posts. And uh, I suck at taking pictures so Instagram's useless for me. <laughs> All right, uh, Natanya. Um, I am Nat natanyabaron.com if you want to find me. I am mostly on Twitter. Um, so absolutely contributing to the, the cesspool that's there. Um, you're most likely gonna find me in my stream of consciousness discussions going on there as well as lots of medieval marginalia and strange quotes from things just because it's very highly amusing to me. Um, uh, I am at Natanya Baron on pretty much all the platforms with the exception of 
uh, TikTok, where I am at Natanya Books, where I talk a lot about ADHD and writing and uh, neurodiversity in general. And my book just released last week, it's this date, Queen of Dunn, which is a feminist Arthurian retelling that's been critically acclaimed. So I have to throw that out there, right? Um, and uh, and yeah, so I, it, very active at the moment, but ready to go into hibernation pretty soon. I've kind of hit my <laughs> hit my limit of brain. So, um, but yeah, that's it. All right, perfect. Uh, Lex. Uh, oh, yay. I thought I was muted for a second. Um, you can find me um, at... Oh Lord, I don't even remember my, I don't remember my, th this is the part where you find out how terrible I am at this. Um, so yeah, I'm at, I think it's, I believe it's lexchristian.wixsite.com. Uh, mostly like John, I am on Facebook a lot. Uh, my group is the Hell's Bells. So if you just, um, type in, if you do a search for Hell's Bells, we'll come up. It's like us and like a, like a KISS, um, fan group. So Mine's the one that's with girls. And um, yeah. Is that B-E-L-L-E-S -L -L or? What? Be uh, bells is B-E-L-L-E-S. Yes, okay. like Southern Bells, Hell's Bells, yeah. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's where I am mostly. That's where you can mostly find me. I am, I'm also, I'm on YouTube. My channel has gotten like, it's 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 in a hiatus right now because it's been a really rough couple of months but um hopefully i'll be getting back to that after the first of the year so all right uh alexander so you can um find uh a web of crimson and also all of the anthologies that i'm in on my website alexandergideon.net remember that it is net because there is uh two doctors that own alexandergideon.com for their one-year-old son who's going to find it really hard to market himself when he gets older um you can also find me at alexander gideon on twitter um i'm irregularly there um you can also find me at facebook.com slash a.g.r.gideon. Um, and you can also read my blog at uh, readisthouwill.com. Haven't put a post up in a while, but I've got a lot of backlog stuff, including a um, workshop on short stories. So you go and check it out. Perfect. Uh, Gail. Uh, pretty easy to find. I'm at gailzmartin.com and morganbryce.com on Facebook. Um, look for Gail Z. Martin, the Z is important. Um, my reader groups are Shadow Alliance for the Gail and Gail and Larry stuff and the Worlds of Morgan Bryce for the Morgan Bryce stuff. Um, I'm in with the Falstaff uh, listings. I'm also on Amazon and elsewhere. And on Twitter, I'm at Gail Z. Martin and at Morgan Bryce book and every other platform is some variation of those names. So pretty easy to find. All right, thank you. And James. You can find me at jamespalmerbooks.net. I've got a uh, an ebook with a couple of short stories you can get for free if you sign up for my readers group there. Uh, I'm on Patreon, uh, James Palmer, um, I, where I post uh, just uh, you know weekly update, uh, semi weekly update, and uh, you know free stories and snippets and things. Uh, I'm at on Twitter at Palmer Writer, but I'm uh, mostly active on Facebook. I've got a Facebook uh, group, James Palmer Fiction, and James Palmer Writer is one of my pages. I've got a page for Monster Earth. Uh, you can find me just all over Facebook. All right. And I want to thank everyone again for joining us and everyone for watching.